Now, if you've been here for the past couple of weeks, you've heard Pastor talk about, you know, the covenant. So what I want to tell you is I'm going to stay within that vein, and you'll see the covenant interwoven into this lesson. Um, so, Dan, so Daniel knew about the covenant. So when the, the Enoch came to him and said, okay, listen, we're going to give you the king's best. The food that the king eats and the wine that the king drinks, this is what we are giving to all of you young men. This is what we're giving you. Out of four, out of 50,000 said no. We won't defile ourselves. Now, what does that mean? Because in Levit you don't have to turn there. Leviticus 11 and 4 through 20 tells you exactly what the parameters were with what Jews could eat and how they could eat. And so Daniel knew this and said, I, I can't eat that. That's not prepared kosherly. I can't drink that. I don't know where that came from. So Daniel said, what I'll tell you to do is give me only vegetables and give me water, me and my friends. And after 10 days, you know, you can test us and measure us up against somebody else and see what, you know, see what we look like. So, but you know, okay. I could eat McDonald's for 10 days. I really couldn't because I don't like McDonald's. I don't do fast food. Just let me put that disclaimer. I could have eaten McDonald's 10 days before this day. You would have never known. I could have eaten only fruits and vegetables 10 days before this day. You would have never known. I mean, my face may be a little bit clear if I'm drinking only water only, but I mean, you would really not see a huge drastic change. So, but the moment that Daniel decided not to defile himself is the moment where God stepped in. Because 10 days is not a logical explanation to be able for you to tell the difference that I've been on a different diet than somebody else. And I won't get into the whole Daniel fast, Daniel diet debate because it really is a diet. It wasn't a debate because Daniel did this for three years. Daniel didn't do this for a week. Daniel didn't do this in January, you know, when it's convenient, everybody's doing the little fast for the new year. He didn't do this. He did this for three years because you had to be in preparation three years before you even went to the king. Because, you know, um, in the story of, of Esther, Esther had to prepare herself for years before the king would even look at, you know, who was going to be his wife. They had to go through a preparation process, and this was his process. So for three years, Daniel ate only fruits, only vegetables, beans, lentils, all of that good stuff. And, but there was a noticeable difference only after 10 days. This was the first evidence of Daniel's life that he decided to take a stand for God and that he decided, I'm going to do something different, and my faith in my God will see me through this situation. And after that, that's what we call surviving. This is Daniel surviving in Babylon because he knows I need to survive, so I'm going to ask for this fruit and this vegetables, and I'm just going to, you know, that's me surviving. Now, when the king saw Daniel, he met with him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he found that they were the most wise, you know, elevated, you know, Jews he ever met, and he decided to elevate them. That's what we call thriving, because now Daniel goes from surviving now he's thriving in a foreign land, all because he made a decision to step out on faith and believe that God will show up. But, and I'm going to get into, you know, how Daniel even knew how to do all of that. But I want to tell you some important things about Daniel's life, so just bear with me. Um, so next we have the king's dream. You can find that in Daniel 2, uh, second, second chapter of Daniel. So um, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, he has a dream. And no one can figure the dream out. And he's just like, you know, if I got all y'all wise men, if nobody can figure the dream out, I'm just going to kill all of y'all and start all over again. So when Daniel finds out, Daniel's like, he goes to his friend and says, listen, we're about to all be killed. Let's pray to God and ask God to give us the wisdom to interpret this dream. So, but in Daniel 1, you'll see at the very end of that chapter, God gives Daniel wisdom. He gives Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wisdom, understanding, all types of things. But he gives Daniel something a little bit different. He gives him the ability to interpret dreams. But Daniel prayed first in Daniel chapter 2. He prayed to God first and was like, God, listen, I, I don't know. I don't know what this dream means because it's, it's a whole bunch of stuff I've never heard of. It's a whole bunch of symbolism. I can't do this without you. So me and my friends, we're going to pray to you so you can interpret this dream because we want to survive. 
Because at this moment, our lives are in danger, and we're just trying to survive now. So now they pray. God reveals the dream to Daniel. Daniel goes, tells the, you know, Enoch, listen, I know the dream. Take me to the king. He tells the king his dream, and once again, Daniel is promoted. Daniel is now thriving. But the one important thing about Daniel being promoted again, Daniel also tells the king, okay, if you're going to promote me, promote, promote my friends too, because they've also prayed with me. And they also sought God with me about this dream. So that's the second thing in Daniel's life. The third thing has nothing to do with Daniel. Daniel wasn't here. You guys may all know the story of the three men in the fiery furnace. So now this is an instance where Daniel's not around, because if he was around, he'd have been in the furnace too. Daniel's not around, but, and this is in Daniel chapter 3. Daniel's not around, but his three friends are caught doing something that goes against the law, but the law that somebody just made because they wanted to catch these Jews because it's like, why are they being elevated? They don't even live, they don't even belong here. They're foreign in this land. Why are they among the, the creme de la creme? So they try to catch Daniel's friends, and it says, listen, you've got these Jews here that refuse to pray and bow down to you. And so, well, the king is furious. He's just like, we'll throw them into the furnace. But the important thing that I like about this story is they weren't just thrown into the furnace. They fell. The scripture says they fell into the furnace. And when they fell into the furnace, I don't know if you, everybody's in here is like falling. You falling. Oh, help me and I can't get up. You seen, okay, you've seen that commercial where the old lady, she falls and then she's got, what's that thing called? Life alert. Life alert. Oh, life alert. Sorry, that's just funny. <laughs> That's just funny to me. But you've fallen, right? Now, you know, when, you're fa when you fell into fire, naturally, it's going to get all over you. However, they came out of the fire, nothing singed, nothing burned. And there was a fourth person in the fire. It wasn't Daniel. It was Jesus before he was shown in the earth. And so now the king is like, you're, the God you serve was able to get the three of you out of that furnace. So now I'm going to make a decree that everybody prays to the God that you all serve. So even though Daniel wasn't involved, his influence on his friends' lives had an influence with the decisions that they made. And the direct realm of your influence, your family, your friends, your coworkers, that will determine your success. If nobody is influenced in your life by you, something is wrong. But if they, they could be influenced negatively because I, I know when I was in school, I used to negatively influence my friends. Like when we were in school, like I would always get my work done. That was just me. Always got it done quick and easy. Like it just came natural to me. So I got bored. I mean, you got these huge block classes, which are stupid to me. But you got these huge block classes, and they expect you to do 15 minutes of work for three hours or two hours, and I'm just like, I, I just can't do that. So I started playing around. Unfortunately, with people who didn't get their work done. But I was a bad influence on them. Be, but I said, well, you get your work done, and then let's, no, 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 I'm just, I'm just, okay, fine. Well, that's what you're going to do. But I was a bad negative influence, and I knew that about myself. And at that time, I was okay with that. But if you're able to be around your friends and your family and no one is influenced at all by you, that means something is wrong. Because your realm of influence determines your success. Because I can tell by the friends you hang around with whether or not you will be successful in life. They will either pull you down or they will either pull you up. I like to hang around people who are going places, who are doing things. I like to hang around people who got a little bit more than me, who, know, who are sway smarter than me because they're going to eventually bring me up. And I like to continue to be around people that are going to push me to be better and to do better. And it's because of their influence is why I'm just like, oh, no, there's much more to life. Because this person has this, and it's not about what they have, but it's all about their influence on my life. So we see that through the influence on their, on their lives, they were able to stand up for God without Daniel. You know, sometimes people will look and be like, well, you know, David just, Daniel just told them what to do. He really didn't because you'll see in this instance, Daniel was nowhere to be around. Now, we go to the next thing. I've got two more. 
Um, the king's second dream. Now, I don't know if everybody knows this story, but the king has a second dream in Daniel 4. The second dream is about, you know, all types of crazy things the king cannot interpret. So, of course, he calls Daniel again. Daniel tells him, listen, king, you need to repent of your unrighteousness or this dream is going to become fulfilled because I'm scared to even tell you what this dream is about. Now, the dream was about King Nebuchadnezzar being driven out of his kingdom, eating grass, you know, dew dropping on him. He's just living with the wild animals, acting like a wild animal. And so a year later, the king's walking around at the top of his palace. He's like, I got all this. Look at me. I'm big and bad. Next, boom, he's driven out. Now the king is living like a wild animal in the wild, all because he didn't repent of his unrighteousness. But one thing to note about Daniel, he wasn't afraid to stand up for righteousness. He wasn't afraid to tell somebody what you're doing is unrighteous and you need to repent because God is not a God to be mocked and you need to repent. And he didn't. And we see all see what will happen. But after that, he was able to get back and regain his kingdom. And after he regained his kingdom, he gave praises to God because then then he figured out, okay, this God is real. But it doesn't always need to take a traumatic situation to know that God is real. You don't need to, you know, live without God for so long and experience so many things to know that there is a God and God is real. Because when you realize that sometimes you may be too far down and it's going to take you that much more to figure out, okay, I need to get up out of this situation and only God can get me up out of this situation. I've, um, there was a time I was in college, I did something really stupid and I let someone use my credit card. And you know, when you're in college, they love giving y'all little credit cards because they know y'all just gonna spend them and y'all ain't got no money. And so I had a credit card, however, I did have jobs. Um, I think I worked two jobs and I was making real good money, so I just thought I was doing it and I could handle it. And I was handling it, however, I let someone use my credit card. Dumb. Um, so when I let somebody use my credit card, I found myself and I think about $7,000 of debt. Now, that may not be a lot to you, but, okay, that's a lot great. But as, I mean, I think I was, what, 20, 19, I don't know. But that's a lot because I'm just like, wait, I don't even make that much in a year. Like, well, like, I, there's no way I could pay this back. So I didn't even start paying. I didn't, I, didn't pay, I didn't make payments because I just couldn't. The payments were just too high. And I was like, you need to cut it. Uh, okay, never mind. I don't get it. Um, but I just stopped making payments. Next thing I know, the, the collections was coming after me. Who works in collections? Kevin works in collections. A bunch of y'all work in collections. Collections was after me and for years. And it just kept getting higher and higher and higher. And of course, I go to my parents and I'm like, I know y'all got to help me. And they were just like, nah, you got to help yourself. <laughs> And so at that moment, I realized, okay, I can't do this without God. Amen. I can't get myself out of this hole because it'll keep haunting me. Like, I can't get, in, I can't get a car if I want to get a car on my own. I can't do a bunch of things if I want to do on my own because I have this huge debt to me because I was going to school for free. Now, I had this huge debt that was haunting me everywhere that I went. And so I, I really began to, like, just seek God on how to get out of debt and how to, you know, radically, you know, minimize my debt. And I was able to get out of debt within like a year or two years once I made that decision. But I didn't really have to go down that road to realize that God could get me out of debt. That was something that I didn't have to do. That was a situation that I allowed myself to be in, that I put myself in. And a lot of times we put ourselves into these situations and then cry, God, God, where are you? And then God is just like, well, well where was I when I was telling you not to do that? I was right here. And now all of a sudden you want God, and so now you have to, to get this relationship with somebody you don't really even know to get you out of a situation. So, um, and, and that's like in school. Like, you, you guys don't develop relationships with your professors, your teachers, your principals, because I always did, because when I was in a situation, they could vouch for my character. But when they don't know you, when you don't have a relationship with God, he can't vouch for anything for you. And then he'll say, no, I know exactly who you are. You're exposed. I know exactly who you are. I can't vouch for you. I'm not just going up and get you out of this situation. You're going to have to do some work yourself. So um, that was the whole thing with Nebuchadnezzar. Now, now we have the writing on the wall in Daniel 5. 
Now, Nebuchadnezzar dies. His grandson is in charge. Now, his grandson decides, oh, I'm big and bad. I am going to take, you know, the cups, the goblets, all those things from the holy temple of God, the God of the Jews, and I'm going to let my concubines, my wives, my nobles, all of them drink and eat off of them. Now, you know, God is not a God to be mocked because after that, they see a huge hand writing on the wall, something no one ever could figure out. So, of course, you know, one of his wives says, listen, there's a man named Daniel who was there when your grandfather was in charge. Call him. He knows. He probably knows what to do. They call Daniel. Of course, Daniel knows exactly what the writing is because now Daniel has the spirit of God operating with him. Now he can interpret. That means you are about to die. And as soon as he said that, he dies. And so... And from then we realize God is not to be mocked. But before he dies, he tells him, listen, if you can figure this out, I'll, I'll drape you with robes. I'll give you all of this. And Daniel's like, that's really not necessary. And from this moment, we see Daniel still just surviving. But even after he interpreted it, he got everything that the, that the king said he would get, and he was promoted again. Now here we go. Daniel's thriving with another king, another king that doesn't know anything about him because Daniel told him, Daniel said, you were around when your grandfather got driven out and was living in the wild. Why haven't you learned from his mistakes? And that's the same thing a lot of us do. You were around when your parents might have found themselves in debt. You were around when I was found myself in debt. You were around when your, when your relatives, your friends, found themselves in some situations that weren't savory. And still, you do the same thing. 